Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles again to the book of Jonah, chapter 2. The book of Jonah, chapter 2. We're not going to finish chapter 2 up tonight, but we're going to look at one verse. That's verse 9. Then, Lord willing, next week we'll look at the last verse, and that's verse 10. Jonah, chapter 2, verse 9. As we, we, We're going to look at prayer with action. Prayer with action. With action. Jonah now has taken this second chapter to pray to God and to, to recognize God and who he is. He, he, in verse 3, he tells God his condition and what he's feeling like. In verse 4, he feels like, you know, that he's been cast out of God's sight and those kind of things. And he's, he talks about the very fact is in verse 7 that his soul faints within him, and, but yet he remembers the Lord. And in verse 8, it says, those who regard worthless idols, we talked about that last week, they forsake their own mercy. But Jonah says here in verse 9, in response to now this prayer, there's action. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. And then he concludes his prayer with these words, salvation is of the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for, gosh, the book of Jonah and all it's been. We thank you for your Bible, the whole book. We thank you, Lord, that your word is clear about us moving out in action in various ways, different gifts that you've called us to be a witness for you by word of mouth and by word of living our lives. So now, Lord, help us to learn from Jonah now as he, he concludes his prayer. And he, he, he states he's going to move in some kind of actions here. Help us to learn from them, grow from them. And with your spirit's help, Lord, help us to apply them in our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer with action, prayer with action. The truth is, and I'm sure you would agree with it, is that our faith is to have a response in action. It's James chapter 2, verse 20. James chapter 2, verse 20 asks the question, but do you want to know? That's interesting that James says, do you first, do you even want to know? Oh, foolish man, and anyone would be foolish who doesn't want to know. Do you want to know? Here it is, that faith without works is dead. He proposes it here, James does, in a question. Do, do you know? Do you understand that our faith will have a sense of action to it? It's, it will have legs on it. It will, it will cause us to move and do some particular thing. And, and that is so important for us to, to, to gather this up, this point up, this, this reasoning, this scriptural reasoning that we even get here from the book of Jonah, that you and I are called to be people to, to move out in a, in a working faith, a faith that is with works. Primarily, foundationally, when we talk about our works of faith, primarily, foundationally, three. Number one of the three is a work of devotion to God, a work of devotion to God. We see that through, throughout the whole Bible. We see it really neat in a picture way. We see that with men like well, Abraham or Noah being the first one that would build an altar unto God. And we see this happening. Abraham was just always doing it. He went back to one offering he did in a place called Bethel and, and reestablished that altar. It, it was a faith that had works on it. And we see it in all various different ways that we're call, called to do it, not only here in the book of James, but it's a, it's a work of devotion to God, like the altar being built, a devotion to God. Um, your devotion and I should be in picture. It should have a sense of being able to see our devotion. And it's not to be seen that we want other people to see us in our devotion. But it, but it should be that way. One of, the, one of the great encouragements that you and I will give to other people, it's important to other people, is our devotion to God. What, what a beautiful thing for, for your children or your grandchildren to bust into your den or your kitchen table and they catch you in prayer. Man, that'd be a beautiful thing. That'd be a, that'd be a holy interruption. And, and we would hope that, that 
our lives would demonstrate like a person praying to God, someone on their knees. We, we would hope that that would be an expression of our faith, our devotion to God, our surrender to God, our submission to him. And it'll be something that will be seen, something like an altar. It'll be noticed. It'll be noticed. Number one, works of devotion to God. Number two, works of righteousness before God. Devotion to God, righteousness before God. It, it's, li it's living righteous. Our works of our faith should always, always show forth a righteousness and understanding that it's always before God. It's always before him. I, I don't live in and of myself. I, I think that sometimes, and that's a wrong thing to think. We, we always live before God. God had to remind Abraham that. We talked about that before. And he told Abraham after this baby's born now, not Isaac, but Ishmael. And God told Abraham, Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. You ain't been doing that, Abraham. You've been walking like I don't see what you do. And there's this, this holy fear of God when I realize and when we all realize that everything we do is before him. So there's the righteousness. You heard the story before. I think I told it before. A man is in front of him. When you get the newspapers out of the machine, you put your quarter in, you open it up, and you grab a paper for the morning. There was two men. One man was in the process of getting this paper out. And as he put his quarter in, he opened the lid, and he knew there was a guy behind him, and he left the lid open. He told the guy, hey, go take one. Go ahead, get one. <laughs> and uh, this guy was a man who believed he walked before God. And he said, nah, shut it. <laughs> I'll buy one. I'll buy one. You think, you think it's only 25 cents? No, it's bigger than that. It, it's, it's a work of righteousness. It's doing the right thing. Faith without works is dead. Works of devotion, works of righteousness. And then thirdly, the last one is, Works of service to other people. <clears throat> Work of service to other people. Being able to render service to other people. Being able to recognize that I need to offer service to a person. All the way it be to something that is as natural as holding the door for someone who's coming into a place you just made access into. There, you, you, you hold the door for them. Or, or seeing a neighbor that that, that need some assistance, like their lawn mowed or something, Wh whatever it may be. You and I should be rendering these works of our faith in devotion, in righteousness, and, and perceived service. When we see service that we need from other people. You and I are called to be servants. We're called to be servants to God, but also servants to other people too. There's a call to move in action, and I love it. It's Ezra 10.4. Ezra 10.4. Ezra 10.4 is, is the people talking to Ezra. Ezra is the high priest, and they, they push him. I was going to say encouraging him. This is more than encouragement. They push him to start doing something that's been neglected. He, they, they hadn't been doing it, and that's to hold the services of God, to, to do the will of God, to, to act out the sacrifices and the worship and the incense offering. They hadn't been doing it. So the people in this renewed, in this revival, in this awakening that they have, they say to Ezra, first of all, first thing they say to him is, arise, get up. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Get up to arise, stand up, be mobile, is what they're saying. Move, not just stand up, but move. He says, stand up, and they say this, this responsibility is yours, or this matter is your responsibility. This responsibility, this matter, you, you're the high priest, you should be doing this. And you and I need to understand, we need to get up and move, do something. But we also need to take responsibility. Take responsibility. It's something that God has given you to do. For Ezra, it's the high priest. For you and I, it's whatever God has called us to do. Whatever God wants us to do. Whatever he wants us to fix in, to focus on, in devotion to him, in righteousness before him, in service to other people, whatever it may be. You and I are called to, to move out in action. Look at the next thing they say to him. 
We also are with you, Ezra. We're with you. You're not by yourself in this. We, and what they're saying is, we agree that we, we affirm you. We agree that you're supposed to be doing this. You, we, we verify it that you're supposed to be doing this. And that will happen. Anytime you and I lock in and move in what God has called us to do, whatever he's called us to do, whatever he's called us out and to do for him, in his name, for his glory, you will find out there's going to be confirmation all over the place. We don't live for that, but we do get that. <laughs> we do get that confirmation, and that's a good thing to be having. We're with you in this. You're not alone. They tell him two more things. Look at the next thing they tell them is to be of good courage. That means to, to be excited about this, not just be, be fearless in this, but be, be excited about it, that courage, to be encouraged, be, have some zeal in doing it. And that's something that the Holy Spirit has to stir up, and he'll stir that up in all of us to have that zeal that we will move in good, good, best, the best courage, the best courage we can. And then look at the last thing they say. It's like the Nike ad, huh? And do it. And just, just do it. And do it, you know? And, and they're saying to him, they just, in, in, in the last statement they say to him, just, just do it. Don't, don't hesitate. Move. Move and do it. Move and do it. You know, I think, I think this is funny. And I, I don't know how much the angels had a part in this, but I bet you they did. When these guys chose the chapter and the verses that put the Bible together, Jonah didn't do that, but other men did that later on. They just happened to have this be 10-4. 10-4 is that radio frequency announcement. That means, okay, 10-4, I'm going to do it. I'm going to move. This is funny there. I thought, thought that you don't have to see that important at all. That, that won't be on the test. But 10 4, just move. Just move. Just, just, just accomplish it. Just do it. You know, uh, Ezra, just do it. So we see that in this call to action there in that neat little verse there in Ezra. Prayer with action. Prayer with action. We see this in cha uh, chapter 2, verse 9 of Jonah. Jonah lists two things that Jonah will put in action. Now, he's always already had his prayer. He's, he's had his, his uh, announcement to God of what he know God can do, what he feels like in the midst of this belly of this fish. Jonah, let me tell you what Jonah's not doing. Jonah's not saying, if you get me out of here, I'll do some stuff for you. You know, it's, it, you, can, you can almost look at that like he's going to make a deal with God. You know, I'll, I'll cut you in. I'll cut you in. Jacob, Jacob tried to do that kind of stuff with God. You know, you, you give me this and I'll give you more than just 10% or something like that. Jacob was like that. He was conniving. Jonah, stop doing that here. You don't do this when you're in some place that God puts you there like a fish. You know, this, this is, he ain't locked in an elevator up in a high-rise building. This man is in the belly of a fish. He's got to be sincere. And what is pushed out, what is forged out like a fire, what is forged out of Jonah now is this recommitment. Because without, without, without verse 9, he, he can't move into chapter 3. He's not going to have verse 10 without verse 9. That would be the, the whole fact that the, the, the well just spitting him up, vomiting him up. There has to be something settled here. And what is settled is Jonah's going to now realign himself, recommit himself to what God wants him to do in his life. Not only just go to Nineveh, that's the case. He's going to have to do that because God will tell him a second time in verse three, chapter 3, go to Nineveh again. But this is Jonah's entire life, and that's how it speaks to you and I too. It, it is, a, it is a, a moving in action, a prayer with action, that we submit our entire life. It's like Jesus and they're in a they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, Father, your will be done. Let it all be what you want. So Jonah says this giving this over to, to God. He gives two things. He puts two things in action. The first thing here in verse 9 is he says, Here, I will sacrifice to you, I will sacrifice to God with the voice of thanksgiving. Clearly, he's going to express gratitude. Now, he's going to do this. He's going to do this before 
verse 10. He gets out of the well, out of the fish. He's going to do this. He, he gives a, a pre-thanksgiving. He's, he's thanking God anyway. We're told to do that in Thessalonians. We're told to, to thank God, not, not necessarily for everything, but we're told to thank God in everything. Every, every day should be Thanksgiving for us, not just the last Thursday of November. Gratitude's a big one. I don't have to tell you that. Gratitude's a big one. You know that. You see that. If you're in the scriptures, you see that gratitude is all. He says here that this thanksgiving that he's giving is, notice he says the word, it's a sacrifice. It's something that's given up with cost. It's, it's, it's a costly effort. And, and he's, he's, he's probably being honest about his condition. It ain't easy. So I'm going to sacrifice over. I'm going to give something that's going to cost me. I'm going to give my whole heart in this to you. I'm going to, I'm going to thank you, Lord. I'm going to show gratitude. I'm going to show gratitude to you. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us, you and me who are Christians, let us continue to offer the, here it is, the sacrifice of praise. Now, he's going to describe what that sacrifice of praise is, what, is, what the core of it is. The writer of Hebrews here at the last line of 13, 15. That is, here it is. This is what it is, the sacrifice of praise. It's the fruit of our lips, and there it is, giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to his name. The core, the foundation, the nucleus of our worship to God is thanksgiving. At least it should be. At least it should be. It should be gratitude. There's always opportunity and reason for us to thank God, primarily for, for our salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. The salvation of our soul is that in his death on the cross and resurrection, we are secure in salvation, eternity. Not hell and death, but life and life. That life that we have in Jesus eternal life we have in him. So we should continue. It should be an ongoing thing, Hebrew says here. We offer the sacrifice. Yes, yeah, sacrifice. It's costly. We, we, it gives over. It's costly in what we do for the Lord. In, in our worship to him, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, that, that our worship, worship to him is, is yielding. It's yielding our whole body, a living sacrifice to God, an ongoing sacrifice we see in chapter 12 of Romans. So having that ongoing sacrifice is that, yes, the fruit of our lips is that we sing, and it's our giving of thanks in his name. Going back to Jonah nine, uh, 2, 9, Jonah says this, that he voices, notice that word voice, voice of thanksgiving, that he gives, he's going to sacrifice to God the voice of thanksgiving. There's that voice thing again. We talked about that when we were in the book of Psalms and about the importance of that, noting the very fact is that, that the voice being used the voice being being stated you're hearing the voice so what david says in, it's in psalm 5 3 psalm 5 3 david says this my voice you shall hear he says there in the morning no david makes point of the very you're going to hear my voice god my voice you're going to hear in the morning you you're going to hear me say something and i think that's very important and i want you to let the the holy spirit really Deal with that in your heart, especially if you struggle with something like voicing to God, giving, giving voice to him. Not, not, not just praying to God, but you can pray to God in your heart and God receives that too. But there are times that he needs to, he needs to hear our voice. He needs to hear our voice. David says, you're going to hear mine in the morning. Oh, Lord, he says here, in the morning I will direct my prayer to you. And then what we talked about Sunday morning, there it is at the end of verse 3 of Psalm 5. And I will look up. I will look up. We'll deal with that again. I think I told you Sunday, Lord willing, when we get to chapter 17 of John, uh, Jesus will literally look up. And while he's praying, he's looking up to God. Interesting. Looking up, having God over everything. David says, I'm going to look up to you because you are high and you are over everything. You're over everything. 
giving thanks to God. We give thanks to God for all kinds of things. We give thanks to God, I think I've already mentioned it. We give thanks for the very fact that it is our salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. We're getting kind of close to Christmas. My gosh, I can't believe it. So looking at these trees when I was in here today, and I was like, oh, my gosh. going to be lights on them trees in a few months. <laughs> Comes quick. But, but just the very fact is that Christmas represents the very fact is of the grace of God that we couldn't reach up to God. So he came down to us. And, and that is something to be real thankful for. It is something to really show gratitude for. Not only that, but we're thankful to God for our provision. The provision that he gives, his daily bread. He said we should pray for it, but he's responsible to, to, to give it. And he does give it. He faithfully gives it. He faithfully gives. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants beg for bread. I, I don't, those who, who move in God's order... And our, the order we're talking about for us is to move in the order of faith that's in Jesus Christ, not a perfect life, but a life that is connected in faith to Jesus Christ. You find out that you, you get what you need. It, it, things are just pr provided to you. Jesus said they'll just be added unto you, just multiplying unto you. Addition, multiplication, just, just it'd be rendered unto you is what he's saying. And that's all in condition that you and I seek first the kingdom of God. And all there it is again, all his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. You'll find out that God is ever faithful to meet your need. You and I find out that he does provide. And we should thank him for his provision. Not only thanking him for his provision, we also thank him not only for our salvation, his provision, but thirdly, we thank him for his protection. His protection. We're going to look at that, Lord willing, next week, verse 10 of Jonah chapter 2. And we're going to look at it. This, this, this fish spits Jonah up on the beach. And, and, and I think about this, and I think Jonah may have been thinking about it too. My gosh, I lived through that. <laughs> three and a half days. Well, three days and three nights, excuse me. Three, three days and three nights. I lived through that. God preserved him through that and there are things that God preserves us through and we should note them we should number them we should journal them into our hearts we should let them be known and we should testify of them whenever the door is open of the goodness of God amen and, and how he preserves how he brought us through things he, he's so faithful he's ever faithful and then lastly, we thank him for his providence, the providence of God. That just means his, his, his purpose, his purpose. It's been, it's been about 15 years now that we moved over here to Virginia Beach. And I was amazed. I was amazed when we moved from Chesapeake over here to Virginia Beach. And we lived in, which someone told me, this, this is called the Providence area of Virginia Beach. Providence, said, Providence, oh my gosh, I just, that's the word that the old King James people used to use. And that's, that's the old English word, providence. It means just God's directed will. It means God's active will, that, that we, we're not left to ourselves. We're not alone. We don't have to do it on our own. No, he does it for us. It is God working in us. He's ordering our steps and, and everything that's promised through the Bible of his moving and his guiding in our lives. And things come about according to his order as we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. The providence. Thanking him for where he's taken us. That is something that, is, that, that I think we should regularly recall. Regularly recall. We need to regularly recall the, the realities of where we are now is because God has taken us there. And there'd there, there be, there be a bunch of them. A bunch of things we can recall and say, oh, that was the hand of the Lord. That was the providence of God. That was the lead of God. I, I just, I just kind of fell into that. And when I fell, fell into it, God was there. Because he, he brought me there. He brought you where you are. Many areas in our lives. So giving thanks for those things. Giving thanks, so important. Something the Bible says to us, and it's in Psalm 107, verse 8. 
Psalm 107, verse 8. Something that the Bible says that you and I, you and I must, must say, or the Bible says to us that we should be doing. And, and I want you to see it that way. Four times, actually, here in Psalm 107, this is the first time that it says this exact verse. And, and it says this, oh, here it is, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Yeah, that's his salvation, providence, protection, and, and provision, all those things we just talked about. That's all in his goodness. And for the wonderful works, okay, for his wonderful works to the children of men. That the Lord would give, that, that man, excuse me, would give thanks to the Lord. It says it four times in this, this song. That is something that you and I need to be doing. Oh, that we would give thanks to the Lord. That gratitude would be on our lips. So it's no wonder, it's no wonder here in verse 9 that Jonah comes off with this first awe. He's only going to have two-point sermon here in verse 9. The first thing is that he's going to voice thanksgiving to God. He's going to sacrifice this thanksgiving to God. And it's something that we should do. The second thing here that Jonah does in his prayer in action, he says, I will pay what I have vowed. I will pay what I have vowed. The word vow there means a pledge of commitment. A pledge of commitment. Again, it, it, it's, it's almost fascinating that we don't know anything else about Jonah. We don't know, again, when he was born. We don't know when God called him. We don't know what kind of miracles he may have done as a prophet. We just know he was a prophet. That's the only other statement we have of him in the Bible, is that he was a prophet. But he's also a prophet that Jesus recognized as a prophet so that he gets on Jesus' list. That's a big one. That's a good list to be on. But we see here that at least this man... This man must have made a commitment to God, a vow to God, that, that he had made a vow as a prophet to God, that he was going to be surrendered. He was going to be surrendered to God, a pledge of commitment. He's recalling now here in verse 9 the pledge he made, and now he's renewing his life to action to do it. I'm going to give thanks to God. I'm also going to pledge or re-pledge, in this case, my commitment to him. I, I, I want all of us, myself included, to, to take times. There's, there's times. I don't know how many times we need to do it. Probably something we need to probably do every day. And that's to, to re-pledge the order of God in our lives. The, the, I know God wanted me to do this. And I pledged him I would do it. I agreed. You agree. Yes, Lord, I know I'm supposed to do this. Whatever it's supposed to be. It's not just ministry stuff. It may be in relationship with, with our spouse. It may be something that we're, we're to commit to it right there at home. We don't have to go out of our house to do it and have this sense of pledge of a commitment. Or it could be something that's devotional, something that's spiritual. And having a spiritual awareness and consistency with something, something that you... You're kind of pushed off. You're not doing anymore. We all have those. We all have those. And, and when things get tight, again, they push out stuff like verse 9. Not only the prayer this man's praise, but now this recommitment to God. This recommitment is, I'm going to do what I vow to you that I would do. He's going to do that. There's wisdom on these vows or these commitments, and it's in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. Proverbs 20, verse 25. The wisdom that God gives Solomon. Solomon says these words. It is a snare or a trap or something that would hold and hinder, have hindrance for a man or woman. It is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy. God, what, 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 a neat, what a neat word. He says... If, he's, if if a person is rashly saying, oh, this is, this is something holy I'm going to do of God, something I'm going to do of God, I'm going to live for God in this, I'm going to do this for God, or those kind of things, things that would be holy. It's, it's important to be careful, very careful that we don't rashly move that way. Or in this case, it says devote rashly as something holy. 
It says we need to walk this kind of carefully when we're doing that. Not hesitantly, not back off. No, what God has called us to do, we need to do. But we, we can't be just real hesitant and, and, and just, just uh, not hesitant, but real rash. We need to be very careful when we do it. Notice the last part of the verse. And afterwards, he, you know, this person can devote rashly something that's holy. And afterwards, look what it says here, to reconsider his vow. He, he, the, the person has said that this is of the Lord. It's not good for anyone to just rashly just say something's of the Lord or something's holy. And then just don't do it. Just don't do it. I remind people that I bring together in holy matrimony and marriage. I remind them a few times in premarital, and I'll say it a couple of times in the actual ceremony. What you do right now is a holy thing. This is a big deal, what you do now. And your commitment to one another needs to be maintained as holy because what God has brought together let no person even yourselves let no person separate it oh we need to hear that we all need to hear that and there there are things not only marriage but there are things in everyone's life not just the preachers or the missionary but there are things in other people in everybody's lives that you would deem as holy and it won't be good for you. It becomes a snare for you when you and I would afterwards to reconsider his vow. Now, I, I, you know, I don't love her. She doesn't love me. I don't love him. He doesn't love me. I just, you know. God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? No. No, he wants you to be righteous and holy. <laughs> you know, it's, God wants you to do his will. And, and that whole point of, of understanding this thing, there, there are things that, that are rightly so deemed holy. But, but I don't want to move into this thing carelessly. I don't want to move into it carelessly. The, the, the work of, you know, just the whole work of, of, of making that commitment is, is a big deal. It's a great truth here. It's a great truth here. Now, now Jesus did talk about vows, too. And he talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to consider Matthew chapter 5, verse 37 here. Matthew 5, 37. Jesus has talked about that. Jesus calls it an oath. He doesn't use the word vow, but vows, but he says an oath. And he talked about swearing to things. He said, don't swear either by heaven or by earth. By heaven is God's throne. By earth is God's footstool. And, and it, it, what, it, what it does, it... it, it, it it actually just erodes the seriousness of something when, when you and I would resort to thinking that if we say, I swear to God on something, that that, that, that would establish it. That would make it, make it happen. I, I will do it because I swear to him. No, that's not the case. And I think some of this from Proverbs 20, 25 plays in this too because I think a person's spiritual life becomes lessened by when, when, when we swear to holy stuff or we swear we're going to do something holy and then we don't do it, I believe that, that makes faith, our faith, kind of erode. So whatever the reason could be, there could be multiple reasons. Jesus says this in Matthew five thirty seven. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. He says that that, that is... Your word should be good enough. Your word should be established as well enough. It should be. You, you don't have to swear to God. You don't have to swear by heaven or by earth. You don't, you don't have to do that. You don't have to emphasize something. You don't have to say, I will. I'll, I'll. You just need to say, yes, I'm going to do it, or no, I'm not going to do it. Now, Jesus gives reason why here at the end of the verse. Whatever is more than these, these what? These yes be yes and no be no. Anything more than these, look what it is, is from the evil one. That's amazing. I never would have drew that conclusion. That just the very fact is that I wasn't saying yes 
my yes be yes, my no be no. I was kind of adding something more to it. Jesus says, you move into more in these, this is influenced by the evil one. And, and, and I think primarily that has to do with our commitment. There are Christians today that, that, that don't walk in the full place of God's purpose and function for their lives only because they feel, they feel unworthy because I made a commitment before and I didn't keep it. I talk to people like that all the time. And they kind of sit back on the sidelines and, and they don't move on the front lines of what God wants. And boy, that's from the evil one. <laughs> that's from the devil. The devil would love to cancel all of us out. So the work to, to, to the work and the move to, to move past this, just letting your word be your word would be of the devil. That's amazing there. That's amazing there. Jonah says, I, I will pay it now. I'm, I'm, I'm not only going to go to Nineveh, I'm going to do whatever else you want me to do too. I made a vow I would do that. I made a commitment I would do that. And he says, now I'm going to hold it. We need to be that way too. Lastly, and we're done, is at the end there, verse 9. Jonah says these words, sounds like he's in the New Testament. My gosh. Salvation is of the Lord. That's how this man's going to end this prayer. That is Jonah's prayer resolve. That is his resolve. He's going to say that, you know what? I've, I've said what I need to say. I, I, I've opened my heart. The conclusion, the resolve is this. Salvation is of the Lord. God will save. God will save me. He's also saying God will, will keep. Keep me. We'll look at that next, next week in verse 10. He'll preserve me and keep me. And then thirdly, in this salvation of God, God will restore Jonah. He will save Jonah. Let's have him be spit up. He's going to keep him. Jonah's going to be aware of that. He was kept. And he's going to be restored back to what God has called him to do. And, and there's that, that salvation that we experience right now. Not, not, not just, not at all limiting the salvation of our eternal life in Jesus, that we are saved. But there's that deliverance of God that's here now. And Jonah's experiencing that. And he says that kind of salvation comes from the Lord. It is of the Lord. It is the Lord's. It's no one else but the Lord's. So we need to trust God in the salvation mercy that we have in him. A salvation mercy. It's the mercy of him that reaches out to you and I. Jonah is experiencing and will experience it in verse 10, the salvation of the Lord. And it will be all full of mercy. Jonah will never forget it. It, it will change his life, obviously. Jo Jonah realizes that, oh my gosh, God is, is good and faithful. He's not going to be perfect, but he's going to be appreciative, that voice of thanksgiving, huh? Appreciative, gratitude for what God had done in his life. And I pray that we all can be that right now. We don't have to wait till we get inside the belly of a fish. Now we can do that right now. There's so much to give thanks to God for. There's so much to, that we can say, hey, God, you wanted me to do that. I know that was you, and I told you I would do it. Lord, I'm going to do it now. Let my yes be yes, my no be no. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to move that way because his mercies are new every morning. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you so much for your mercies that they're new every morning. Your grace, Lord, is amazing like the songwriter wrote. Your love is abundant and everlasting like you told Jeremiah. So, Lord, help us to live in the confines of your love, mercy, and grace. We see it now in Jonah's life. It won't be just because he prayed. No, his prayer was, a, was an instrument of getting him saved. But you saved him. You were his salvation. You, you changed his heart in the conditions of a, the belly of a fish. Thank you so much that we could see that in chapter 2. Thank you so much that we could read his prayer and learn from it. So now, Lord, where we are in life, whatever 
conditions we find ourselves in or whatever confines us and holds us. All of us feel trapped in different areas, different ways, mentally, physically, sometimes with our health, or even spiritually. Help us to know that, Lord, you are salvation. Salvation is of you. So you're faithful to save. Your word says that. You're faithful to save. And we just trust you, Lord, now. Thank you again for your wonderful word and your loving grace. Now may God bless us and keep us and hold us wherever we go from here. May we find God faithful as he is. And may we live in the beauty of his presence and holiness. And may we all always abide in his providence, <laughs> his place of purpose in our lives. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. God bless your hearts. Enjoy the rest of your week. Let's stand.